This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. In the uh, first lecture, I went through calculating the cost of equity. In this lecture, we're looking at the cost of debt, the other source of long-term finance. And we're going to take the same approach uh, as we did with equity, that with traded debt, we know what the market value is on the stock exchange. Um, we know that shareholders will have determined the market value on the basis of their expected receipts and their required return. Well, if we know what they are expecting to receive, if we know the market value, we can work out the return investors require. Uh, however, there's one bit extra here, as you'll see, in that uh, debt interest is allowable for tax on the company. Uh, and so the cost of the company will be that much lower because of the tax relief. Let me show you what I mean. First of all, with exam oh sorry, first of all, irredeemable debt. Uh, irredeemable debt, remember, is debt that's never repayable. And so look at example seven, if you would. FPLC has in issue 8% irredeemable debentures quoted today at 90. What's the return to investors? Well, surely, if you were buying these on the uh, stock exchange, you'd pay 90. You're expecting to get the coupon rate $8 a year interest. And so you're effectively getting $8 a year on a market value of 90, which is 8 divided by 90, 8.89%. That's the return to investors. Uh, and therefore, if the company's raising new money, uh, from debt. Well, if, if the investors can currently get 8.89% on the stock exchange by buying the existing debt, if we're going to raise new money, surely we're going to have to offer them interest of 8.89% to make it worth a while. The fact that the existing debt, which may have been issued 10 years ago, had a coupon rate of 8%, fine. When it was issued, 8% may have been a reasonable rate. But that money's already been invested. We're looking to estimate the cost of raising new finance. And I say again, if investors can get 8% by buying debt on the stock exchange, 8.89, uh, that's the return we're going to have to offer them to get them to lend us new money. However, although investors want 8.89, the cost to the company uh, will be lower because although on new finance, they're going to have to give 8.89%, again, the interest will be tax allowable. And so, for every percent interest you pay, you get 30% of it in this question, tax is 30%. You get a 30% tax saving. The net cost is only 70% of what the investors are getting. Now you can calculate the cost of the company two ways. You can either say, okay, we're giving the investors 8.89%, but we'll get tax relief, so we'll save 30% of whatever we pay them. The net cost will be that times 1 minus t. Or to make more sense of it, 8.89% is what we're giving them. We'll save 30% of the interest because it's tax allowable, we'll pay less tax. The net cost is therefore 1 minus 30%, 70% or 0.7. And so the cost to the company, 8.89 times 0.7, is 6.22%.
as always, generally keep these to two decimal places. Um, and so that's one way. Um, normally, though, is we have one step too many in the sense we don't normally want to know what return the investors want. All we're normally interested in is the cost to the company. And so instead of working out return to investors and then uh, looking at the tax effect, the alternative, the quicker way of getting the same answer, is to take the interest after tax divided by the market value. So on $100 nominal, the interest, the coupon rate is 8%, so $8 a year. The company saves tax on that at 30%, the net cost is 70%. On a market value of 90, which is a net cost of 5.6 a year on 90, is of course exactly the same, 6.22%. So normally we take that approach, go straight to it. Uh, there's no point in working out the return to investors unless you're specifically asked to calculate it. Well, that's easy enough when it's redeemable, however, uh, irredeemable rather. However, redeemable debt uh, I'm afraid takes slightly more work. Uh, let me explain why with the example. Example 8 GPLC has an issue. 6% debentures quoted at 85, they're redeemable in five years' time at a premium of 10%. Well, why is the market value 85? Think back to the earlier chapter. It's the present value of their expected receipts discounted at their required return. Well, for part A, what is are the investors required return? Uh, sorry, what is the investors expected receipts on a hundred dollars nominal? Uh, they're expecting to get a coupon rate interest of six dollars a year. For five years' time until redemption. And then in five years' time, they're expecting the redemption on $100 nominal, if there's a premium of 10%, they're expecting 110 And so that's what they expect. And therefore, what we want to know to get their required return, since the market value is 85 we need to know what rate of interest would end up making the present value of those to be 85. Well, if I stick in the current market value, 85, surely I want the present value of the receipts to be 85. The net present value of all those flows, I need to be zero. And how can I work out what rate of interest gives the net present value of zero? Well, by definition, it's the internal rate of return. If it's redeemable, the return to investors, KD, uh, is the IRR of the flows, the internal rate of return. Now, we, uh, I showed you how to calculate the internal rate of return way back when we looked at investment appraisal. Uh, but in fact, in the exam, the most likely place of having to calculate internal rate of return is here, when we're looking at the return to investors on redeemable debt. And there's no quick way. It's, as before, two guesses and approximate. So let's do it. First of all, I'll work out the present value at 10%. Well, 
Well, 85 is 85. Um, let me find my tables. I'm sorry. What pep is over there? The annuity, $6 a year for five years. Well, the 10% annuity factor for five years is 3.791. And then the redemption, the ordinary present value factor for five years at 10% is 0.621. And so the present value is 6 times 3.791 is 22.75. The redemption, 110 times 0 0.621, 68.31. And so the net present value at 10% is plus 6.06. Well, we want a net present value of zero. To get an NPV of zero, it must be somewhat higher than 10%. So let's have a second guess. I'll guess at 15%. And let's see what we get. 85, what's the present value of 85? Uh, the discount factor for five, the annuity factor rather, for five years at 15%, 3.352. So six a year at 3.352, 20.11. And the redemption, the ordinary factor for five years at 15%. Uh, 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 five years, 15, is 0.497. So 110 times 0.497, 54 uh, 54.67, giving a uh, net present value 20.11 plus 54.67. Minus 85, uh, minus 10.22. And so, the internal rate of return, the return to investors is somewhere between the two. And just like I did in the, um, I went through this in detail on the, in the chapter on investment appraisal. I'll do it the same way. At 10%, we got plus 6.06. At 15%, minus 10.22. Over a change of five percentages, the MPV fell from plus 6 to minus 10, in total by 16.28. The IRR, therefore, we know is more than 10%. How much more? Well, to get to zero, we need the MPV to fall by six. We know that a fall of 16 is five percentages. So it's six sixteenths of five percentages. Which gives an internal rate of return. I'll do this first and then add 10. So 6.06 .06 divided by 16.28 times 5, that comes to 1.86. Add on 10, I get 11.86%. However, that is the return to investors They must be requiring 11.86% in order, or because rather, they determined a market value of 85. However, it's rare that you're asked for that. More commonly, we want to know the cost to the company. And I'm afraid 
I'll explain why after. We can't go straight from one to the other. Because as far as the company is concerned, the interest will be tax allowable, but the repayment isn't. If we do exactly the same thing from the company's point of view, the market value is 85. The interest, well, they will be paying $6 a year, but they'll get tax relief. What's the rate here? 30%. Tax relief at 30%. So the net cost, the interest will only be 420 per year. And then they'll redeem. It's at a premium of 10%, as before, they have to pay 110. And the 110 isn't tax allowable. And the cost of the company, for using the same sort of logic before, again is the internal rate of return. But it's the internal rate of return of these after tax flows. And so let's, but no quick way, we have to do it again. First of all, let me work out the present value at 10%. 85 is 85. And the five year annuity factor at 10% is 3.791. The ordinary present value factor, five years at 10% is 0.621. And so the present values. Fifteen point nine two sixty eight point three one. So a present value of sixty eight point three one. Oh, sorry, a net present value of minus point seven seven. Uh, and so this time. If it's negative at 10%, the IRR must be a little bit lower than 10%. And so uh, I'll do a second guess at 5%. Uh, 85 is 85. Uh, five years at 5%. The annuity factor, 4.329. And the ordinary factor, present value factor for um, five years at 5%, 0 0.784. So the present values, the interest, 420 times 4.329. 18.18. 18 the redemption, 110 times 0.784, 86.24, and so the net present value plus 19.42. So again, let's approximate between them. Uh, oh dear, 5% plus 19.42, 10% minus 0.77. Over a change of 5%, MPV falls by 90, plus 19 to minus 0.77, a total fall of I think that's right, 20.19. And so the cost of debt to the company is the IRR of the after tax flows. We know it's more than 5%. How much more? We need a fall of 19 to get MPV zero. We know 20 is 5%, so it's 19.42 divided by 20.19 times the change of 5%, which gives a cost of debt 
of nine point eight one per cent. So again, a couple of things here. Firstly, if it's redeemable debt, there is no quick way. We have to calculate the internal rate of return. Uh, and because re irredeemable debt is so quick, uh, redeemable debt is very common in the exam. You know, I stressed before how to calculate it. You must make sure you can calculate internal rates of return without wasting too much time. And secondly, it's extremely unlikely you'd be asked to calculate the return to investors. I've done it. If you are asked, you do it on the flows ignoring tax because the investors do receive the full interest six a year and the full redemption. But it's rarely you'd be asked to do that. Usually, oh, well, virtually always, it's the cost to the company we're after. So you go straight to part B. You get the after-tax flows. Interest is tax allowable, the repayment isn't. And you work out the internal rate of return. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to do both is do appreciate that when it's irredeemable, sorry, it's not again, when it's redeemable, redeemable, the cost to the company does not equal, I think you should have seen that symbol before, but it does not equal the return to investors times 1 minus the tax rate. It did for irredeemable debt. It doesn't for redeemable debt. And why doesn't it? It's because when it's redeemable, interest is tax allowable and the repayment is not tax allowable. Now I've said twice, I'll say again, that question eight, it is very unlikely you'd be asked for part A. It is very likely though you'd be asked for part B. Go straight to the after tax flows, internal rate of return. Uh, you'll know incidentally assuming you watched uh, the investment appraisal lectures, that the internal rate of return is only approximate. Uh, the relationship isn't linear. So it's only about 9.81%. Uh, with different guesses, you'll end up with slightly different answers. Um, in a section C question, that doesn't matter. You would still get full marks if you'd use different guesses, provided obviously you've done your workings right. Um, in sections A and B, the two mark questions, uh, because people use different guesses and therefore get slightly different answers, uh, you'd almost certainly ask it to the nearest percent. And whatever guesses you've used, the nearest percent you should get here, uh, 10 percent. As to what guesses to use, I'll tell you what I do. To give me a rough guide, I say, well, if you take the after tax interest of 420 divided by the market value of 85, that gives me that 4.94%. Let me check again 420 on 85. Yeah, it's 4.94%. Now, it's going to be a lot more than 4.94% because there's such a lot extra on the redemption. But as a result, I actually would have done my first guess, 4.9, I would have done my first guess at 
is positive, so my second guess would have to be higher, and I would do 10%. Um, I only have it unless it's really ridiculous. I tend to always use 5, 10, 15, 20, but two of those, depending on the magnitude of the figures. But I'm afraid that is practice. Anyway, we've worked out the cost individually with cost of equity, remember? It's using the formula. The cost of equity, D naught, one minus, blah, 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 D naught times one plus G over P naught plus G. The only way you can make that a bit longer is have you work out, uh, estimate the rate of growth. With the cost of debt, if it's irredeemable, it's very straightforward indeed. If it's redeemable, it clearly takes that bit longer, having to do internal rate of return. However, the final bit, and the reason we're going to have one more lecture on this, is that of course most companies borrow from both. They borrow, they must borrow from equity, obviously, we've got to have shares, but they'll be borrowing from debt as well. And so, the final bit of, the, of, the, of this chapter, if they're borrowing from equity and they're borrowing from debt, we need to work out an overall cost of all the finance, which, as you'll see, is something called the weighted average cost of capital. But that's the next, the last lecture on this chapter, putting the two together and working out an overall cost.